so there's a paper of the same title that will be coming out uh, very soon in the next few weeks, I suppose. And the way that came about was because of the 50th anniversary of the famous 1964 paper, there's a special edition of uh, Journal of Physics A. And there was, it was going to be devoted to Bell's inequality. And uh, having had some experience with a wide variety of physicists, um, I know, I'm not quite sure why they asked me how I got on their list, but anyway, I got on their list, and, and, and I thought I just needed that there's a lot of um, residual lack of understanding of what Bell actually did, and that it would be uh, a bit tragic to have this memorial volume and not for it to be clear exactly what Bell proved. And so I wrote. It's, it's a, in some sense a very basic talk, as you'll see. And it was so controversial uh, that the editors decided that it couldn't be allowed to be published without a reply. Because what I'm going to say was, um, is very strongly rejected by quite a lot of physicists. And then there's a response, so there's a reply by Reinhard Werner, and then I respond to that reply. Okay, So that's just to say that. Um, there, there may be two classes of people here, and the lar a very large class might say, I know all this. Why are you wasting my time? Um, and all I can say is, if you're, especially if you're a student and you're young, you have to be prepared to discover that things you take to be perfectly obvious and uncontroversial, extremely senior, well-regarded physicists will tell you, you don't understand. Right. You've made a mistake. You're, 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 there's some supposition you're unaware of that you're using. Um, so you have to be aware that that's out there. <laughs> um, I'll, I, if, if you want, at the end, I'll talk about, for example, what Werner said and uh, other things. I, I, that's not part of this. The other thing that will surprise you probably, but this will be obvious, is that although it's what Bell did, essentially, this is a very long exposition to make clear the meaning of the first paragraph of the paper, of Bell's paper. <laughs> Because that's where everybody goes wrong. They don't understand the first paragraph. And then, of course, after that, it's a complete disaster. So let me just start with this. So here is, and I, I guess I, I'm now repeating myself, the first fundamental fact you need to know is that, right? Uh, that there's just a tremendous amount of, of failure to appreciate what the proof actually proves. And it's more than that, right? Um, as we'll see. It's not that people just don't get it. They actually believe he proved things that he vociferously would deny having proved. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying these things now, but I'm going to give you a nice piece of evidence in a minute. Um, the second fundamental fact is the reason for this is because they don't understand what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen proved back in 1935. And um, Bell, of course, did understand what they proved, and he furthermore assumed, and this was his big failure, that the reader understood. Um, and therefore, he only goes very lightly in the beginning over what the situation is that he's starting with. And there's now if you get yourself back to EPR and you start thinking about what physicists typically say about Einstein, you find that behind this, there's been a systematic and widespread system of in misinformation distributed to the world about why Einstein didn't like quantum theory. Um, and I think it's probably not too much to say that this is, in, in, in a way, I don't know, intentional may be too strong, but there's a very strong motivation. There was a very strong motivation, obviously, for the physics community that was defending quantum theory to somehow neutralize Einstein's criticism, right? Einstein was the most famous physicist in the world. And if he's going around saying there's something rotten at the heart of quantum theory, 
they need to somehow get people to not pay attention. I mean, either address his problems, which they didn't want to do, or get them not to pay attention. So there's a kind of mythology that has arisen about why Einstein didn't like quantum theory. And if the mythology were true, then it would be very easy to dismiss it. Um, so that's why we really have to go back. Now, all of the things I just said require some evidence. And so here's the evidence. Um, when I started to, and, and, and let me give you the background here, when I started to write this paper, I said more or less all these things about these widespread misunderstandings. I said, well, I better have some, give you some grounds to believe it, because you, offhand, you shouldn't believe it, right? Offhand, you'd think, how could a large part of the physics community misunderstand Einstein or, 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 or incorrectly dismiss Einstein, of all people, right? Or not understand what Bell did. I mean, your first rational reaction to what I've said so far should be disbelief, right? You shouldn't believe me. How could that be? How can any well-organized rational enterprise have produced that result? So I figured I needed some evidence. Now, I, I just want to say how I got this, because I was going to talk about this misunderstanding of Einstein's worries about quantum theory. And I thought, well, everybody, this is so common, I just need to Google. And I Googled the two words, Einstein dice. And on the first page, the fourth hit was this video. Now, this video is produced by the Institute of Physics. So it's a very kind of big mainstream physics organization that put together a nicely produced explanation to the general public about Einstein's worries about quantum theory. And so I hope this will be loud enough. Let me get it as loud as it'll go, and see if I can, well, I, I don't know if the microphone's just recording. Uh, now, the question is, how do I get it started? Oh, here. No. I know I can do it. Come on. It just went over. Start. No. Sorry. Here we go. Okay, so Einstein didn't like quantum theory because it's not deterministic, and Bell proved you can't have a deterministic theory that returns the predictions of quantum mechanics, right? And that's standard what probably most physicists believe. All right, so, I mean, the first thing to notice, given that he said, that, you know, and, and I, when I Googled this, I wasn't even looking for Bell, right? I was just looking for Einstein, and Bell, he popped that in. That was just a, an extra thing at the end. So, again, maybe everybody knows this. Bell, supposedly the guy who proved you can't have a hidden variables, deterministic hidden variables theory that reproduces the predictions of quantum mechanics. What did he actually say about uh, the pilot wave picture, which is exactly such a thing? You've probably seen this quote um, uh, telling us that it ought to be taught to every physics student so that they can see as he says, the vagueness subjective 
subjectivity and indeterminism are not forced on us by experimental facts, but by deliberate theoretical choice. So Bell obviously didn't think he'd proven the impossibility of deterministic hidden variables, just the opposite. Right? He thought it was a very promising, one, one of promising, and he was, as we'll hear, Bell was wonderful about recognizing the potential for clearly formulated theories and ways of understanding quantum formalism, and it was you know, both with the, the Bohmian mechanics and then with the GRW theory when it first came out. He saw what it accomplished. Okay, uh, what about Einstein? What about this idea that what Einstein hated about quantum theory, the reason he couldn't accept it was because it was indeterministic. He was just some old fogey, too caught up in classical ideas, couldn't get with the program. You've probably all heard this. Well, and when I say there's been a systematic attempt to distort this, I'll tell you something about this quote. This quote should also, the beginning of it will be familiar, hopefully, to all of you from John Carlo's book. Uh, so it seems hard to sneak a look at God's cards, but that he plays dice and uses, quote, telepathic methods as the present quantum theory requires of him is something I cannot believe for a moment. Okay, so sneaking a look at God's cards is John Carlo's book. But here's another fact when I was looking this up. This was some time ago when I was looking this up. What I found was that that on the web, more times than not, you do not get this entire quote. There's an ellipsis. The part that's been cut out is, and uses telepathic methods. Okay? So what you read reinforces the myth. But that he plays dice, as the present quantum theory requires of him, is something I cannot believe. Okay? Now, what Bell understood, and what's perfectly clear, and I'll give you again a little more evidence, was that the indeterminism wasn't really what bothered Einstein. It was the telepathic method stuff. And it bothered him about the standard theory, about what we would call Copenhagen, which is more or less equivalent nowadays. Some people don't use the word Copenhagen, but they say, oh, I believe in operational quantum theory. You may hear that. It's more or less the same thing. And the same comments will apply. OK. So here's, uh, again, a, a letter from Pauli to Born. This is quoted by Bell uh, and makes the same point in the middle. Einstein does not consider the concept of determinism to be as fundamental as it is frequently held to be, as he told me emphatically many times. He disputes that he uses as a criterion of admissibility of a theory is it rigidly, rigorously deterministic? So, you know, Einstein also is sitting there yelling at people, no, that's not the problem, okay? That's not why I don't like quantum theory. All right, so the reason he really didn't like quantum theory was, as, as he said, the spooky action at a distance, right? Uh, and the place where that was first laid out, but unfortunately in a way that was not as elegant and concise as it might have been, and maybe involved adding some extra parts that lead to some confusion, was in the einstein podolsky rosen paper. So all I want to do when I say EPR and NEAT, I mean I, without any extra frills, you know, I'm trying to present the argument in a way that doesn't involve any other complications. Um, the EPR argument does depend upon a locality principle. It, in, it, it employs a locality principle. Part of the problem, looking back, is that it seemed so self-evident, this locality principle to Einstein, that he doesn't make a big deal of it. He doesn't focus on that. And so, again, if you're not paying enough attention, you might misunderstand what his target was. So if you think, you can read the paper and think, oh, his target is uh, uh, showing that you can beat the, un the uh, uncertainty principle. 
or that you can overcome complementarity or something like that. And that's really not the point of the paper. Um, where the locality principle appears in the paper is when they apply their famous criterion for an element of physical reality. Now, this is also something I'm going to talk about for a while because it's not unusual, and I'm just speaking from experience here, it's not unusual to come across physicists who say, well, of course I don't accept the conclusion of the EPR paper because I reject their criterion for an element of physical reality, right? Their paper relies on this criterion, so if I just say, I don't like your criterion, then I can ignore everything else in the paper. And much of what I want to do, again, is just to say that's not actually an acceptable response to the paper. There are acceptable responses, but that's not among them. Why not? Because the criterion, and, and this is the one little bit of philosophical jargon I'll use here, is what philosophers call analytic, um, which means the truth of it follows just from the meanings of the words, like a logical truth. And so you can't say, I don't, I'm going to reject that. It's not a claim of physical principle or physical fact. What you can dispute is not the criterion itself, but you can dispute whether in a particular concrete situation the criterion applies. And that is something, you, if you want to reject the conclusion of EPR, which was that the quantum description of a system is not a complete physical description, you can reject that conclusion by saying the situation they describe is not one where the criterion applies. But that's going to involve something to do with locality. Okay, so here's what Here's the, the passage where they introduce the criterion. And again, uh, uh, if you haven't gone back and read the paper and you just sort of hear about it secondhand, it's useful to notice how careful they are here. I mean, they're careful to say, for example, what they're giving you is a criterion. I mean, they say they're not giving you a definition of physical reality, of reality, of what it is on, you know, what it is that makes something real, or what are the conditions better, what are all the conditions under which we would have to recognize that there's an element of physical reality. Um, they certainly say here, it's nice, they say you can't determine it by a priori ph philosophical considerations. So you have to look at the physics and you have to look at the world to have a reasonable claim to show that something is real. But instead of, if they gave you a definition, then it would cover all cases. They're rather just giving you a criterion, which is a sufficient condition, but not a necessary condition. And it's the thing that they've italicized. If without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, i.e. with probability equal to unity, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. Okay. And they say, notice, they say about this criterion that it's in agreement with classical as well as quantum mechanical ideas of reality. That's also true. You often hear, if, you, if people say, well, suppose you give me the quantum state of a system. What physical properties does that system have? And one answer you'll hear is, oh, well, you have these operators. Those somehow, the operators represent possible physical quantities, and the condition for the system to have a particular quantity is that it be in an eigenstate of that operator, and the value is then the eigenvalue. And that's, of course, also exactly the situation where you can predict with certainty what the outcome of a measurement will be, right, when it's in an eigenstate. So this is in line with what even standard discussions of quantum mechanics would say. Now my claim is that the thing italicized here is not something you can reject. And you just have to reflect on the meanings of the words in it. I mean they say here 
The, the one thing, if I could rewrite this paper or give them a suggestion, it would be that they say um, the criterion they regard as reasonable, which sounds like you can reject it. Because, okay, I can, it's reasonable, but still, maybe I can make an argument or something. Or, you know. But I think it's more than reasonable. It just follows from the words. So why does it follow from the words? Well, because it has in it this word disturb. If you can predict without in any way disturbing a system. Well, what is it to disturb a system? It's to alter its physical state. If you do something and you say, whatever I just did did not alter the physical state of some system, then you would not say you disturbed the system. Okay? So suppose you do something and it doesn't change in any way the physical state of a system. And on the basis of doing it, on the basis of that procedure, you can now predict with certainty how that system will behave in some experimental condition. Then all they're saying is, first of all, there must be some physical characteristic of that system that guarantees it'll behave that way. That's just to say we're doing physics, right? I mean, you're saying it has a physical feature. And that physical feature must somehow be determined by its physical condition. And since the procedure didn't disturb the system, it must have had that feature before I did my procedure, right? Because my procedure didn't change it. In particular, my procedure didn't bring that physical characteristic into existence. And it must have that physical characteristic independently of even whether I do the procedure or not. Because again, the claim is the procedure doesn't disturb the system. So what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen conclude is that even if I'm just in a, a position in theory to make this determination without disturbing the system, then, there must, then the system must already have some physical characteristic, one which I could, if I so cared, find out what that characteristic is without disturbing it by doing this procedure. So I don't see anywhere one can object to this criterion. Okay. So first of all, if I do the procedure, then I found out what that characteristic is. The characteristic was already there because I didn't disturb it. And then the further thing is, even if I'm just in a position to find out and do this procedure, then the characteristic must already be there because doing the procedure, again, whether I do or don't do this procedure doesn't make any difference, physical difference to the system. And that's all just built into the word disturb. Good. So I don't think you can somehow attack the criterion. What you can do is say, in a particular concrete situation, you have to ask yourself, does the criterion apply in that situation? Because it, 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 it involves this condition that your procedure doesn't disturb the system. If you do a procedure that does disturb a system, then the criterion tells you nothing. Right? It doesn't tell you anything one way or another about what the elements of reality are. Okay? Um, and so really the question is, how do EPR argue that a certain procedure doesn't disturb a given system? The way they do it is by using remoteness in space and time as an insulator against disturbance. Right? So that's the fundamental assumption. And that's in a locality assumption. Right? It's just the assumption that if two systems are far enough away from each other in space and time, no procedure carried out on this one can immediately alter. I'll, I'll, have a, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 more, a, a kind of slightly more precise version of what this locality, condition of locality that's assumed by EPR is. Okay. So this is my way of putting, this is not what they say. It's got some fuzzy words in it, but you'll see they're fuzzy in the right direction. That is, they make what, they're fuzzy in a way that if you deny what I call EPR locality, then it's all the more striking what you're saying must be going on, right, if EPR locality does not obtain. 
So EPR locality just says that according to the theory, if you carry out some procedure in one region, that whatever those procedures are, they do not immediately disturb the physical state of systems in a sufficiently distant regions in any significant way. Now, the fuzzy words here are sufficiently distant and in any significant way. Okay? How far away does the other system have to be to be insulated against disturbance? Well, the theory should tell you there at least should be some, some distance, right? <laughs> If, if a mile isn't enough, make it a million miles, okay? If you say, according to my theory, there is no distance sufficient to insulate it, that's pretty striking, right? What does in any significant way mean? Well, again, maybe you do something over here and it does disturb this system, but not much, okay? And you say, well, how little? Well, suppose, uh, you know, I can make that disturbance as small as I like. Then it still is EPR local in my sense. Uh, I'll give you an example. So if you're going to deny that a theory is EPR local, what are you saying? You're saying there are some procedures carried out in one region do immediately disturb the physical state of systems in extremely different, arbitrarily distant regions and in a significant way. Right? It's a significant disturbance. It's a big disturbance. It's a disturbance you could notice. It's a disturbance that could make a difference to how an experiment carried out in that other system comes out. Okay? So if, if you deny EPR locality, I think Einstein's words that you're, you're signing on to spooky action at a distance is quite well founded. Now, the way I've just defined it, every classical theory, even Newtonian gravitational theory, so often you'll hear, oh, Newton, Newtonian gravitational theory had, of course, some spooky action at a distance or some action at a distance in it, and that's why people didn't like it and this and that. Notice the way I've just defined it, even no matter how you understand it, Newtonian gravitational theory does not have spooky action at a distance. Uh, in fact, as I said, no classical theory had it. And this is for two different reasons. Sometimes they both apply. One reason is spatial attenuation. So let's grant for the moment that Newtonian gravity is instantaneous, is an instantaneous action at a distance theory, right? A mass here produces a force arbitrarily far away on every object in the universe instantaneously. Um, Newton, by the way, did not think that. This is not Newton's own view of gravity. He didn't think gravity worked like that. He thought gravity worked by some kind of particles and he didn't know what they were and how they behaved and that's when he says hypothesis non fingo. Right? I'm not gonna grant, I'm not gonna frame any hypothesis about what's causing this force. But he said enough for you to know that he didn't think it was action at a distance. And he said enough for you to know if he thought it was particles going from, for example, between objects that was carrying the gravitational force, enough to know that he wouldn't have thought it was instantaneous either. There would have been some time of flight. But he doesn't go into that. And for his purposes in doing planetary theory, it's essentially a, a static gravitational field, so the time delay wouldn't matter. If you got into fine details of, of, of objects orbiting each other and, the, and you can't treat either one as at rest, then that time lag would actually make a difference to the predictions. Okay. But the point is gravity is an inverse square law. So it attenuates, and if you get far enough from some system, then nothing you do, it will, do to it will have a significant gravitational effect right, on, on the distant system. So that's why we can, you know, uh, otherwise we would have to take account of every piece of mass in the universe to make any predictions in Newtonian gravitational theory. So the attenuation by distance makes that theory EPR local in the sense that I've put out. The other reason that theories are EPR local, classical theories, is this time lag, because there's immediately in there, the, the effect of this procedure is supposed to be immediate, 
Well, if there's a time lag, if you need time for an electromagnetic wave to get from here to there or for the particles to get from here to there, then the further apart you get the systems, the greater the time lag and the more you can be sure that doing something here isn't going to disturb the thing over there in this window of opportunity where you're doing an experiment far away. Okay? So for that reason as well, I say Newton actually would have expected there to be such a time lag for gravity, and then, th then you would fall afoul of the immediately part if there's such a time lag. Good. Okay. So let's suppose the world is EPR local the actual physical world. Then, if you're in this situation, and I can do two experiments arbitrarily far apart, and the theory tells me that the outcomes will be perfectly correlated, then it follows, if we accept, right, if it's an EPR local world, doing this experiment doesn't disturb the state of the other system, but by doing this experiment and applying the correlation predicted by the theory, I can predict the outcome of the other experiment, and therefore there has to be an element of reality pertaining to each system that determines the outcome. Right? Because we can experimentally make this determination. And by the criterion, we're saying one experiment didn't disturb or alter the state of the distant system. Now notice, um, just this, for a single, the, the, the place where e, the EPR paper gets a little overly complicated is, in the EPR paper, they set up this entangled state between our two particles where there's a perfect kind of correlation between the positions and a perfect anti-correlation between the momenta. So you can run this argument both for position and for momentum. But that's not important, right? In, in order to make their point, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the fact that you can do it both for position and momentum. Just notice that you can do it just for position. That is, by making a measurement of the position of this particle, I can now predict with certainty what the outcome of a measurement of the position of that particle will be. According, to, if the world were EPR local, then there'd have to be something about the distant system that determines the outcome of that position measurement. But the point is, the initial quantum description of the pair does not attribute such a property, right? The initial entangled state does not, is not an eigenstate of the position operator and does not tell you what the outcome of a position measurement will be. So if by the EPR criterion you can say, but there is a piece of physical reality over there that determines that, then you've already got, without mentioning momentum, you've already got the conclusion that the quantum description is not complete, which that was, was the title of their paper, is the quantum mechanical description of reality complete. Okay? Um, so if the world were EPR local, the measurement on one side would not disturb the state on the other, therefore the position, there's a position measurement element of reality of the distance system that's not reflected in its quantum state. And then you can run the same argument, if you like, for momentum, because the anti-correlation in momentum gives you the same situation. And then you can argue that, gee, not only does each particle have to have, as it were, a definite position, it also has to have a definite momentum. And then you can say, gee, that violates the uncertainty relations and blah, blah, blah. But that's just all add-on, right? The argument would still go through without all of that extra stuff. So EPR leaves us with a dilemma. We, if we accept the predictions of the quantum formalism that give us these perfect correlations, then either the quantum description is incomplete or the actual physics of the world is not EPR local. Now, Bohr and so on, one thing, it's a little bit hard to understand their reaction to this. It was never quite clear, but one thing that was clear was they wanted to insist that the quantum description was complete. And if this is our dilemma, right, either incompleteness or non-locality, and they're, they're absolutely clear they're not giving up on the completeness of the quantum theory, then they're committing themselves implicitly to non-locality, to spooky action at a distance. The standard theory Right, the Copenhagen interpretation, and the same thing goes for operational quantum mechanics or anything you like, commits itself by insisting on already, just 
at EPR, just by the EPR argument, commits itself to a kind of non-locality. Okay? And that's how we get Einstein's remark that in the standard account, God both plays dice, since there's no pre-existing element of reality, and uses telepathic methods. Now, and, and notice they're, they're linked, right? It's because God plays dice that he also has to use telepathy. In the EPR case, you could get rid of the non-locality, but only at the cost of getting rid of the indeterminism because of the perfect correlations. Right? So the EPR paper certainly does not prove, and Einstein didn't think it would prove, that there was spooky action at a distance. It just proves that if you take the standard account of quantum theory, you're committed to spooky action at a distance. Now, Schrodinger, and I'm not sure again how, how well known this is, the famous Schrodinger cat paper, was written in response to the EPR paper. And, and, and Schrodinger was really quite shaken. Um, when he writes the paper, he says, I'm not sure whether to call this a, a, a report or a confession. And he extends it. So he notices that, that there are maximally entangled states of two systems such that any measurement I can make on this system, I can predict, accurately predict the outcome of that measurement by doing a procedure on the other system, an appropriate procedure on the other system for anything. And so if the world were EPR local and what I do over here doesn't disturb the state over there, it follows that there would have to be elements of reality that determine the outcomes of everything I could do over here. Right, so you would, have, as it were, have, have to have determinism of every observable property. Uh, now, Schrodinger illustrates this in this very beautiful uh, analogy. So he says, imagine I've got a bunch of school children, and they're, they're trained in this weird way. Right? I have a whole bunch of questions I can ask them. I don't know the answer to the questions, but there's a book over here that has the answer to every question a hundred questions, and I have a bunch of students, they've all been through some training program, and here's the way they behave. I can arbitrarily pick any of these hundred questions and arbitrarily pick any of the hundred students and ask them that question and check in the book whether they gave the right answer, and they always get it right, every single time, every single time I do this experiment, okay? For every, for every question. Now, Schrodinger says, there's an odd thing, which is that after I ask the first question, the student gets confused or tired and can't answer any further questions correctly, okay? He said, that's kind of weird. But okay, that's kind of weird. So asking the question somehow freaks them out. But it, it doesn't affect, he says, it doesn't matter that they can't answer further questions. Still, that the answering the first question so tires or confuses the pupil that his further answers are worthless changes nothing at all of this conclusion. He says, the only thing you can conclude is that every student is prepared to ans correctly answer every question, right? Because I can arbitrarily pick a student and arbitrarily pick a question, and they always get it right. So every student has to have been, the only other possibility is you know, some conspiracy that, no, this student only knows the answer to question 43, and somehow when I pick them, I always somehow magically pick question number 43. That's crazy, right? So Schrodinger notices, and this is not something you know, uh, uh, that, uh, from the EPR thing, of course, then you say, look, if you reach the conclusion that every student has to be able to answer every question, so there's, as it were, a corresponding element of reality, then in the EPR pay case, I can check position on one side and momentum on the other, and then use the correlations to attribute across the thing, and then get a position and momentum attribution for each particle. Right? And so here's what Schrodinger says. There's no doubt about it. Every measurement is for its system. The first measurement on separated systems cannot directly influence each other. That would be magic. Neither can it be by chance if from a thousand experiments it's established that virginal measurements agree. But he says the prediction catalog, and this is, I get the little, the Q is one system, the little Q and P are one system. I measure, say, uh, uh, position on this system and get four, and then I measure the momentum on the other system and get seven, and then I predict negative seven here. And then he says, well, that 
would be hypermaximal, right? I've now attributed both a position and a momentum. That would violate the uncertainty relations and everything. There's no quantum state that'll give me that. So Schrodinger understood perfectly well. The point is, Schrodinger, what, what EPR says is, look, it's either determinism or spooky action at a distance. And Schrodinger said, look, it's either magic, <laughs> that's his word for spooky action at a distance, or hypermaximality, which is, there are more facts here than you can, than, than the, the uh, uncertainty relations allow. Now, after Schrodinger, now I'm, I'm not even going to try and go through Bohr's response to the paper. There we are in 1935. Einstein understands what's going on. Schrodinger understands what's going on. But we don't get Bell, right, for almost another 30 years. So there's a really interesting question, because we're, we're, as it were, on the edge of what Bell did. But obviously, there was some very large conceptual block to get over. Um, the, probably the most interesting that ha thing that happened in between was just rewriting when Bohm, in his textbook on quantum theory, rewrites the EPR argument in terms of spins. Because Schrodinger considered making different measurements on the two sides, but the only case he considered was position momentum. And in position momentum, there's no correlation at all, right? Finding out the position doesn't change your predictions for the momentum at all, right? So there's no information. And if you ask, well, what about, what about as it were, all the other possible things you could measure besides position and momentum? Formally, they're well-defined in the theory. But practically, it would be very hard to tell an experimentalist, right? So, you know, think of there must be some quantum observable that corresponds to position plus momentum, right? You take two Hermitian operators and add them up. But if you say, here, go to an experimentalist, here, measure this. Uh -huh. You could also explicitly consider um, harmonic oscillator yeah. energy at values. That's right. He did. So there were some things. But mo you know, most of the things wouldn't be. But once you put it in terms of spin, it's obvious how you measure all the different spins. All you're doing is reorienting your magnets in space. So the idea that you should check not only what are the correlations when the things are perfectly aligned and what are the correlations when they're uh, orthogonal, but what are the correlations at all interme intermediate degrees? It's going to occur to you once you reformulate this in terms of spin. But of course, even that isn't going to get you there, or Bohm would have discovered what Bell did. Um, so that brings us, now let me just recap everything. So Einstein's complaint about standard quantum mechanics is not that it's indeterministic, but that it requires a form of non-locality. The form of non-locality that Einstein worried about obviously has nothing to do with actually sending signals in any practical way, right? He never thought, he said, insisted, standard quantum mechanics is shot through with spooky action at distance. But he certainly never thought that means you can send signals, or he would have worked on the theory and said, here's how you do it, right? And in fact, it's obvious that the actual EPR correlations you can, you can reproduce without anything that would allow you to send any signals. So that's not the meaning of non-locality for Einstein. It has nothing to do with signaling, or he wouldn't have been on about it. The correlations that Einstein looked at don't require action at a distance, because you can recover the phenomena without any spooky action at a distance, but only in a deterministic theory. And that's the point of the bertelmann socks case, which, again, if you do this, you will find people who don't understand Bell in a horrible way mangle the point of bertelmann socks um, Bertelmann, you know, as you know, I guess, always put on different colored socks in the morning. So when you see one sock, that provides you information about the other sock but there's nothing non-local in that. But what Bell says is, quite correctly, there's nothing non-local because they have their colors all along, right? They have their colors when he put them on in the morning. If you believed, which would be a weird thing to believe, that Bertelmann socks, neither of them has any color at all until you look at it, then you would be really puzzled, right? I mean, first of all, you'd be puzzled about how you're looking at the sock manages to bring a color into existence. But you'd be even more puzzled 
that somehow looking at one sock and bringing its color into existence then alters the other sock so it can't assume the same color, right? Einstein, of course, thought you could find an EPR local theory that would recover all the predictions of quantum theory, at least all the verified predictions. And by the EPR argument, in settings like, like, like the EPR setting, where you have these perfect correlations, it would have to be a deterministic theory. Uh, and although, and this is now the main point, Einstein seemed to prefer both EPR locality and determinism, EPR locality was the more important to him. Right? That was the thing that bothered him about standard quantum theory, was that it did seem to have to deny EPR locality. So now we get to Bell, right? So after 30 years, Bell has the advantage of, 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 of uh, Bohm's rediscovery of the pilot wave theory, which is a demonstration that you can, of course, recover determinism if that's what you want. But, and this is in the paper that Bell wrote before the famous paper, the one that was published afterwards. So he says, in this theory, in in the pilot wave theory, an explicit causal mechanism exists whereby the disposition of one piece of apparatus affects the results obtained with a distant piece. In fact, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox is resolved in a way in which Einstein would have liked least. And that's absolutely right. You want determinism, I'll give you determinism. If you thought what Einstein wanted was determinism, then he would have been happy. Einstein would not have been happy. because. And, and, and Einstein had been playing also with similar theories and, and I believe, we think, discovered that he couldn't come up with one that got rid of the non-locality. That's why he didn't like them. He certainly didn't like Bohm's theory. He said it. If all he cared about was determinism, he would have loved the theory. Now, uh, another little comment here. Um, when, I, when I submitted this paper that's going to be published, I got two referee reports one of which saying it was a piece of trash and should never be published. Um, and the other of which, which was nice, it was a pleasant thing, but it was an interesting thing because the person said, you know, I'd completely forgotten that the title of Bell's paper is on the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, right? That's the title of the paper. So if you want to say, I want to understand what Bell was doing, the first thing you want to do is go back and think about what the einstein podolsky rosen paradox was, right? <laughs> and people, you know, sort of know Bell did something, but good. So here's the first paragraph. As I said, my whole talk is just basically about the first paragraph, but now we understand the importance of it. The paradox was advanced as an argument that quantum mechanics could not be a complete theory, but should be supplemented by additional variables. These additional variables were to restore, right, to restore to the theory causality and locality. So notice, restore, right? Quantum theory is not causal, that is deterministic, and is not local. I'm trying to get the locality back. In this note, the idea will be formulated and shown to be incompatible with the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics. It is the requirement of locality, or more precisely, the result of one experiment on one system be unaffected by operations on a distant system with which it has interacted in the past that it creates the essential difficulty, right? You can't, what you can't get back, you can get back determinism if you want it, you can't get back locality. We are stuck with non-locality. What are the presuppositions of Bell's proof? Well, the accuracy of quantum predictions. There's an assumption when you do the proof of EPR locality, as I've described it. And there's an assumption that your experiments are essentially random samples from the actual, if I have a collection of, of systems and I do experiments to collect statistics, that I can think of those as being random samples out of the whole collective. That's it. From the accuracy of the quantum predictions, in particular the perfect correlations or anti-correlations, and from the assumption of EPR locality, you find you have to say that there are elements of reality that predetermine the results of experiments. Uh, on one system and that uh, obtain independently of what experiments are carried out on the other system. And from the assumption of random sampling, we get that the observed statistics of the outcomes must be pretty close to the actual statistical distribution of the, in this whole collective, even though we can't check all of them in all the systems. 
The main mathematical observation is just that there's no possible distribution of such local elements of reality that can have the observed statistics. And that's just a mathematical fact, right? Uh, there are two, I'll go just quickly through two, I, I guess everybody knows this, but because, again, you often hear, there are some kind of weird presuppositions. As I, I mean, I say, when, when the response to my paper, what Werner says is that I make, I and Einstein and Bell all make yet another presupposition we're unaware of that you can deny, a preposition he calls classicality or rea realism or something like that. He gives it a bunch of names. And he does the favor in his response of saying what that presupposition is. So according to him, the presupposition that I make and that Bell makes and that Einstein makes and that if you deny undercuts all of these arguments is the following presupposition, that the state space of the theory is a simplex. <laughs> That's what he said. It's going to be published. It's nice. It's there on paper. That the state space of the theory is a simplex. Now, if you can find in the arguments I'm about to give you anywhere the assumption that the state space of my theory is a simplex, please raise your hand. <sighs> okay? I mean, that, that's a condition. It's not, in quantum theory, it's not true. The state space, at least of all the density matrices, don't form a simplex. But the point is, it's not a presupposition of the argument. Einstein never presupposes that. Bell never presupposes that. So let's just look at the, what's the argument. Well, we look at polarization. We know that if we're checking polarization on appropriately entangled photons, that the photons will either both pass or be absorbed by their polarizers, cosine theta squared of the time. So they'll agree they'll either both be passed or both absorbed 100% of the time when they're aligned, 75% of the time when they're misaligned by 30 degrees, and 25% of the time when they're misaligned by 60, just by plugging in cosine squared theta. The 100% correlation means we're in a position by doing a measurement on one or an experiment on one to predict with certainty the outcome of an experiment done on the other. And so if it's an EPR local theory, all of the results must be predetermined by elements of reality. Okay? So that's what the EPR argument tells us. If, if, if you've got an EPR local theory, then all of these have to be predetermined. And then, as you know, there are different ways of proving this. This is the one I like, where people, you know, it's one of many. You say, look, suppose they're all predetermined. Each, each photon is just like the other, predetermined in what it's going to do if it meets a polarizer set at a certain angle. Uh, suppose at 30 degrees, you have a, you're, you have a stream of, of uh, a collection of pairs. In this pair, both of them will be absorbed, both of them will be absorbed, both of them will pass, and so on. Let that be whatever you like, right? Put, fill in this middle row, row however you like. The mathematical requirement is that if I were to check at 30 and 0 rather than both at 30, you would get 75% agreement. So that means I can only change 25% of these letters from middle to top. And if I check at 30, 60, I have to have 75% agreement. So I can only change 25% of the letters from middle to bottom. But if I only change 25% going this way and I only change 25% going that way, then there have to be at least 50% where they still agree on top and bottom. But you tell me if I check on top and bottom, there's only 25% agreement. So it's mathematically impossible. Now, yeah. OK, good. That's perfect. The other nice example you've probably heard is this beautiful example of, of Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger, uh, where you, get, you don't even have to worry about statistics. You have a triple of particles in a certain entangled state. You can subject each of the particles either to an x-spin measurement or a y-spin measurement. The predictions of the theory is that if you check two x-spins and a y-spin, whichever ones you like, there'll be an even number of up results. If you check all three Y spins, there'll be an odd number of up results. So that's just the prediction of the theory. And these can be done as far away from each other as you like. So if the theory is EPR local, the result of each possible experiment must be predetermined for each particle, irrespective of what, if anything, is done to the others. So your job is to put U and D into these three circles 
So this would tell you whether if I check the y spin on particle one, I get up or down. If I check the x spin on particle one, whether I get up or down. You have to put u or d in these three circles so that I have an even number of u's along the blue lines and an odd number along the red line. And this is, you know, Merman said this in a very nice way. It's easy to see that's mathematically impossible. Suppose you've done it, uh, you have these little chips with u's and d's on them, then I've picked, if, if I pick them up, I pick up an even number when I pick up those three and throw them in a hat, an even number picking up those three in a hat, an even number picking up those three, throw them in a hat, an odd number of u's picking up those three and throwing them in a hat, even, 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 odd. I have an odd number of u's in the hat, but I picked up every single one twice. Can't be done. Just mathematically impossible. Okay, so that's it. That's what Bell did. Right? He showed that no EPR local theory can replicate the predictions of quantum formalism for experiments done far away from each other, and ultimately we'll say it's space-like separation in relativity. We can make this sort of precise what we mean, you know, thinking relativity should certainly isolate these systems from one another. Therefore, if the predictions of quantum formalism for such experiments are accurate, then the physical world itself cannot be EPR local. The world itself is not. That's what I said in this paper. That's what they all get upset about. Bell didn't prove any such thing. So, in the sense that bothered Einstein, there is, in fact, spooky action at a distance. If you accept that the predictions of quantum theory are accurate. No. So that is what Bell did. <laughs> that, yeah, that's the conclusion, right? That's what Bell proved. Uh, and all of this other noise you hear which you'll hear a lot of about Bell having done something much less significant or just ruled out hidden variables or whatever, is, is, is not right. Now, hopefully, I mean, Lev is going to um, tell, tell you that if you go many worlds, let me just say this about, I'm not sure what Lev is going to say. One way of understanding some of the many worlds people is that they will not even ob object to any of this reasoning, but in a way, say, no, if you think the predictions of quantum, I'm including among the predictions of quantum mechanics, so let me say this directly. I'm including among those predictions that when you do an experiment, there's a unique result. There's one result. And so you can unproblematically talk about the correlations between experiments carried out far away. If whenever I do an experiment, I get all the results, it's not quite clear what you even mean by the correlations between distant experiments, okay? But I'm including among the predictions of quantum mechanics that experiments have unique results. Whether, now whether the, that means the many worlds you can think of as denying one of my presuppositions, whether that makes it a local theory is still an open question. Because we have to then think through carefully why the world should appear as if there's only one result and how this all gets implemented. So I'm you know, trying to keep enough room to have that discussion, which maybe we'll have later today. But on the assumption that, uh, that experiments have outcomes, that's the argument. Those are all the presuppositions, and that's what Bell did. Thank you.